Hello, this is Elaine Sugar, award-winning children's program facilitator and overall supporter of children's dreams. Welcome to the Empower Teen Self-Esteem Podcast. We bring you ideas and resources that help teens shine and help ease parents' minds. This is Elaine Sugar, and I am so delighted to be with you today and bring you a very special guest for this episode of Empower Teen Self-Esteem. We have Janetta with us, and Janetta is going to tell us all about the Epiphany Process. That is her organization. She has uh, come through some amazing challenges and turned it into something that is really beneficial for us all. Uh, Sometimes when we go through things, we do enough just to get through them ourselves, but there are some special human beings that can actually take those situations, share them with us, empower us, and do things to uplift others. And I think that basically describes Janetta. So welcome, Janetta. How are you? Oh, what an amazing welcome. Thank you so much, Elaine. Well, you've earned that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. What a a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast, because what I've seen, the work that you've done for teenagers, it's beyond heart opening. So it's such a pleasure to be here today. So thank you. And yeah, the, the backstory is that I'm a mother of four. And Mm -hmm. um, uh, one day uh, after having an enormous argument with my 16 year old daughter, Jenny, um, she took herself off in a rage to pack and leave home and actually went to her room and killed herself. So you can imagine uh, the the shock of that was enormous. My, My whole life went to ground zero in that moment. And uh, there were times where I thought I'd never get through it. And my, my turning point, my most defining moment was prophetically nine months after Jenny died. And I was walking mindlessly along a pavement and I knew I needed to, to cross the road. And I stepped off that pavement and I was really very not present at all. A big part of me was going, this is like a lifetime prison sentence and I don't want to live like this. It's, it's horrible. And um, so I was weaving mindlessly through the traffic and got halfway across. And as I was standing in the middle of the road, I went, oh, my word, Janetta, you've forgotten you still have choice. Wow. It feels like you have no choice but to be like this for the rest of your life, that you're imprisoned. And then I carried on. Somehow I wove through the rest of the, the, the traffic and I got to the other side and stepped onto the pavement. And at that moment, I realized I had prophetically crossed over. And it was my crossing over moment on many levels, because we all know the connotations of crossing over. So in a sense, Mm -hmm. I I died to the way that I believed I was stuck in and rebirthed myself. And then I started searching uh, because I knew I couldn't do a hit and miss process. Try this, you know, try that. Mm Um, and in, in applying whatever it I applied would work sometimes and not others. I knew I had to find something that was accurate to get through this. And, um, that's what happened. I found what I call the yin and yang of science. Mm -hmm. And, um, I started uh, studying it and researching it and expanding it. And of course I had to walk the walk and talk the talk with it. And I always say, I didn't have a Janetta to help me through with it. And um, got it to where it is today. I've helped people for over 12 years now, internationally online, um, in different programs, one-to-ones. I've got two certification programs, which are amazing. Uh, as people master this process more and more. And most importantly for this podcast, 
Um, I've helped teens who are in bed, self-harming, mm -hmm. writing suicide notes, not washing, not wow. eating, been there for months and months and months. Parents are mm -hmm. wringing their hands, almost resigned that this is it. And they're out of bed after three or four sessions. And That's phenomenal. It, it is. It, it's really amazing. And um, one of the things that hit me when I came across the basics, because it is scientific, but I won't, I promise you, I won't speak science speak. Otherwise, I'll leave everybody. You, you, you know what? You have figured out how to help people and touch people yes. all around the world. So whatever path you choose to take during this interview, <laughs> trust me, I, I am trusting that you know exactly where you're leading us. So you go right ahead. Well, I'll put it in a nutshell, but basically <clears throat> our Western world is quite addicted to being positive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> that, that mindset of only being positive and eliminating all negative thought, word, and deed kicked into place, well, actually kicked into place 160 years ago in Scotland. Um, wow. A man called, funnily enough, he had the name called Sam Smiles. <laughs> I laughed when I came across it and he wrote a book there. He was one of the learned few and he wrote this book for the learned few. So not very many people got it or understood it. And he advocated, you know, eliminate negative thought, word and deed. And, and then, of course, it, it disappeared in, in the annals of time. And then in 1952, another book was published in, in the States. And um, it was post Second World War, where everybody was in the nightmare of war, mm -hmm. uh, having got out of it. And they were looking for a, a, an open, a heart opening way of living a less nightmarish life mm -hmm. and so the power of positive thinking was published in 1952 by norman vincent peel and um a huge chunk of the world took on that mantra of of only being positive and uh, don't get me wrong being positive is very important right. um, it's it's vital but if you look at how the world operates everything works in cycles Mm -hmm. So the noise coming out my mouth now are decibels of cycles and the weather cycles and female cycles. And we even talk about brain waves and waves, yeah, yeah and waves of emotions. So we understand mm -hmm. that our thoughts and our feelings work in cycles as well. And if, oh, and let's go to electricity. That's a really good example of how something so powerful that we have um, a had to be harnessed and managed and mm -hmm. B had to be looked at at how it works. And if you look at how a cycle works, it requires equal amount of positive and negative in that cycle for it to be empowered. We mm -hmm. all know if you take negative out of a cycle, of electricity, what it does to electricity, there's, it's disempowered, there's no electricity, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all understand that, but there's been this silent conversation that our thoughts and our feelings and our psyche doesn't apply to that law. We must only be positive. And when I came across that, I was going, holy moly, that's what I have been questioning my whole life. Because it mm -hmm. was like this constant contradiction of something's missing. Because basically, there are nearly 5,000 human traits in, listed in the dictionary. 4,700. And approximately half are, are positive and half are negative. They're all human. They make us what we are, a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The good Lord gave us 4,700 human traits for a reason, because they're part of our cycles. So um, when you try and eliminate all the negative traits that are inside you and only be kind and loving and thoughtful and gentle and all the virtuous mm -hmm. traits, it basically means you're judging half of who you are as unacceptable, unloved, unlovable. 
And it's why so many people wake up in the mornings going, something's missing. Well, it's mm-hmm. half of you that's missing. Half mm-hmm. of the, appreciating and loving the half of you. You're, you're only learning to love the other half of you and to judge that half of you that you say inside internally is unaccepted and unlovable. So what this process does is it, and that's why I call it the yin and yang, because it's the balancing act. Instead mm-hmm. of being extremely, because when, when, you, when you judge, when you're in a charge about something, it may be about you or about someone else or a group of people or a set of circumstances, when you're feeling charged up about it, that cycle, which is usually a lovely round cycle around the line of balance oscillating, gets Mm -hmm. extended. I'm getting a bit scientific now, but it gets extended and distorted. It's no longer round. It looks like a, a frisbee. And suddenly it's polarizing your positive and negative side from each other and giving the illusion that the two are not part of the whole. So mm-hmm. when you're feeling extremely positive, you uh, uh, that feels like the truth. And then because our unconscious consciousness knows that it's only half of the truth, it catapults us over into the extreme other direction, into a place of nightmare. So here, this is kind of in the extreme. It's a fantasy place where we're priding ourselves for getting it all right and being model citizen, number one. Gotcha. When we get catapulted to the other side on the journey of understanding how valuable and loved and lovable that side of us is, it feels mm-hmm. like we've been shoved into nightmare and life is unbearable Mm -hmm. and we feel guilty and ashamed that we haven't met the high standards we set ourselves on the other side and so what happens is life feels like a roller coaster you're going from okay I'm I'm okay I'm okay I'm okay and then you're down here going I'm not okay I'm in the most terrible place and then suddenly this feels like the truth yeah. And we're blocked okay. and blinded and distorted from seeing the other part of the truth. When you learn how to reverse those polarities and bring the cycle back into manageability, the most amazing thing happens. We create what's called a photon in science, and photon means light, and we lighten up. So my clients sit there going, <gasps> or if they don't go, her, they go, Oh, my word. I had one yesterday. She said, I've never thought about it that way. And it was about her Mm sister-in-law. And I was going, so how do you feel about your sister-in-law? And she goes, I feel so, I've had 30 years of really resenting her. And I feel so like it doesn't matter anymore. And she's okay. And it happens in a split second. And that's why it's called the epiphany process. Epiphany. So that's it in a rather large nutshell, but it is a nutshell. It's like this big nutshell. Yes, and I want to dissect that that nutshell a little bit because there were so many impactful things that you mentioned. So I also want to make sure we thank you for being willing to share uh, what happened in your family and what happened with your daughter because that's a very private space. And so to open that up for us, we appreciate that. Oh, thank you. I would ask you, what would you say if we have teens listening who may be at odds with their family members or their friends or someone at school, and they just feel like they don't know how to get past that moment? Uh, what What do you say to someone who's maybe had a, a very serious disagreement with someone and they 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 have that type of frustration, you know, that could lead to a next step of something that's destructive. Yeah, well, one of the first things that I can say is when I explain how a, a photon works and this dichotomy between positive and negative and polarizing because that's where bipolar is because the more you try and be more positive the more you elongate or the try and be negative negative because there are a lot of people addicted to being negative Mm -hmm. 
it, it distorts and the more bipolar one becomes, because we're all bipolar. We're bipolar in a place of manageability. We're going positive, negative, positive, negative when we're feeling balanced because mm -hmm. that's what sound vibration light is. So just by explaining that, I watch teenagers, just what I've explained, but I explain mm -hmm. it in a little bit more detail. You can see them going, this is what I have been questioning all along. And there's this lightness of being because they know I'm talking a scientific truth. It's not a let's try this. It might work thing. It's mm -hmm. it's an actuality. And they sit there going, yay, I feel like there's there's more than hope. There's certainty. And so the, the hope comes in, but there's a certainty. And that's even just explaining that helps them with that relationship with somebody at oh, school good. or a group of somebodies, because already <laughs> they're knowing that it's not all about them, but it is all about them and that they don't need to, to worry too much about the group outside themselves if they've got the questions to ask themselves within themselves to create the balance of the charge they have about that person or that group of people that they will change. So an example I can give you, because mm -hmm. uh, I think this is where people go, well, I don't understand. So it is about doing the work internally. When you work on yourself, it's not about changing the person outside you or the group of people because that's their journey and their choice and their decision and you're not in control of them and you never will be but you you are able to manage yourself mm -hmm. so an example would be when I first came across the very basics and I went to study it over one weekend these basics and it was nine months after Jenny died and I still mm -hmm. had Jenny's baby sister at home but my husband and I were estranged and every Sunday before I went away, I'd get a phone call from him and I'd have to hand, put the, the, the phone out here and go, wow, okay, and then finally hand it to, to my daughter. I went away and I worked on how angry I was at myself, how angry I was with Jenny, you know, I, I wanted to kill her when I found her. It's that like, oh, I'm so angry with you. And how angry my, my now ex-husband wow. uh, was. And I worked, I worked the, the positive, negative, positive, negative questions backwards and forwards. And I came home and it was time for that call, that call. And I picked up the phone and suddenly here he was going, hi, how are you? What, you know, um, and I'm going, you're not shouting and screaming at me anymore. And it made me realize that I had worked on myself and I was no longer attracting his anger. You know how when you meet somebody and they instantly make you feel, Ugh! and they have yes. you in their mouth, just the energy. The energy. Yes. And so many people don't realize that um, we're doing that all the time with our relationships. So there'll be two people sitting with opposite charges that attract to each other. So if I'm feeling like I'm the victim, I'm going to attract the bully. And mm -hmm. the bully becomes my inadvertent teacher. And for the bully, me as the victim, I'm their inadvertent teacher because we've attracted each other in that cycle. And so I, I realized that I had attracted anger. And the moment I had taken that anger and worked on it in myself and discharged the anger I had, the judgment I had towards myself, it dropped the attraction to be to have him angry at me. That didn't mean he'd sorted out his anger. That's his journey. Right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in science, we call it the simultaneous synchronistic happening, where when you drop a charge towards something or someone, 
it doesn't mean until you work on it yourself or, or the, the, the charge is dropped and you're no longer attracted to be whatever it is you are towards that person, you're going to find it spreads in a new way. So you're either attracted to be angry in that moment at somebody else with the same wow. energy, or you're attracted to a group of people or circumstances that add up to that energy. And wow. so it meant he no longer, I was no longer attracting his anger and, and I, it just blew me away. And in fact, we only had one argument since then and, mm -hmm. and Jenny's been dead 16 years now. We've only had one argument and it was really, really needed where boundaries were left, uh, overstepped. And I stepped into appropriate anger, which is you don't have permission to do that. And it will stop now. And, and that's what happens with this is that you step into wherever the anger needs to be expressed it's in a place of balance that's appropriate to whatever's presenting itself. You know what? There's so many unique perspectives that you're presenting. And I want to make sure um, that our listeners are getting the full benefit. So can you step back for a moment and talk about how when you were in that instance with um, your ex-husband, you said that person can become your inadvertent teacher. Yeah. Can you expand on that point? And just so we make sure that our, our young audience understands exactly what you mean by that and how that plays out. Yeah. Well, what happens is anything we judge in ourselves as being unloved, unacceptable, unlovable, we again inadvertently attract people and circumstances into our lives that reflect that which we judge in ourselves. So they become our reflection. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give, this is a really great example. Um, okay. I always call, I call this, this example is my Susie and Johnny example. So let's say we've got a, 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 a playground with, with a lot of bullying and victimization going on because it happens all over the world. Right. And there's this charge that actually it's really bad. And in actual fact, it isn't. It's just that it's out of, out of manageability and it's extreme. That's the missing because uh, uh, testing boundaries and stepping into your own, your own space and mm -hmm. being able to manage those boundaries is what bully and victim is, but it's in manageability. Okay. So let's say, for example, Susie's the victim and Johnny's the bully, but it can be the other way around. But mm -hmm. we'll, just for this example. And... As they step onto that playground, they almost sense each other's presence without knowing they are. And I'm talking about all relationships now, but in the form of bully victim, because what I'm explaining now happens in all relationships. So <clears throat> uh, when they see each other, they only have eyes for each other. They don't notice anybody else. Johnny's mm -hmm. not interested in bullying Mary or, or, or Caroline or anybody. He doesn't even notice they're there. All he can see is his eyes are on Susie and she's, she's the, the focus of his, of his bullying so he can bully her. And she, all she can see is, is, is him going, you know, you, you're nasty and you need to change. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm trying to protect myself. So this is the story that Susie's running. Um, because what happens is, this, this is, a, a, if I go a step backwards, if you've got the line of balance and you're oscillating on either side of line of balance, going positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. Mm -hmm. If you try and put, let's, let's use your, let's use your um, body as an, a diagram and put one foot on one side of that line of balance of your thoughts and feelings and consciousness and the left foot. And you've got, let's say, right foot is positive and left foot is negative. 
And there you are, like a finely tuned engine going positive, negative. Mm -hmm. And then you're told you can only be positive. So off you go being, and now you're leaning towards the right side, all the positive traits, kind, loving, giving, thoughtful, peaceful, philanthropic, gentle and off you go can you see how far away you've started leaning maybe even hopping away in that diagram from the center line of balance to that place i mentioned of fantasy and priding yourself you're being model citizen number one when you get catapulted or roller coasted over to the other side, you've gone the equal amount of distance in the opposing traits, the opposite traits, to nightmare. So life has become a nightmare and you're feeling guilty or ashamed. So this is where, where, where Susie's sitting the, on that cycle of bully victim. She's going, the world is a very unsafe place. And unless everybody, including her and the people that she loves dearly and the whole world at large, starts being kind and gentle and loving and giving and thoughtful and peaceful. And can you hear where she's hopped off to into the extreme yeah. of one sided perception? And she says, unless everybody does that, unless everybody becomes filled with peace and kind, kindness and gentleness and thoughtfulness, unless everybody does that, the world as we know it and all the people she loves dearly and the world at large will die. That's the charge she's sitting with. This mm -hmm. is the charge Johnny's sitting at. The world is a very unsafe place. And unless everybody and all the people that matter in his life and the world at large start being aggressive, angry, forceful, violent, da da da, can you see where he is hopping off onto the other extreme? And unless everybody becomes like that, the world as he knows it and the people that matter the most and everybody is going to die. So they're running so, the same. So both figure. of them are thinking, right. Both of them are yes. thinking that I have to be this way and everybody needs to be this way because this is how you survive. Yes. So if wow. you remove Susie and Johnny from each other, all that will happen is Susie will carry on attracting Johnny in different forms again and again and again and again. And Johnny will carry on being. And, and I, what I haven't mentioned is that in other circumstances, Johnny's the victim and Susie's the bully mm -hmm. because we've all got it in us. So yes, unless, yeah. So unless you sit down with Susie and Johnny and say, you know what, you both have worth in each other to show the parts of yourself you're judging in yourself and how to love them. So you start showing Johnny the value of being gentle, kind, loving, giving, thoughtful, peaceful, and all those things that because he judges them as really very dangerous to go to. And when you start teaching Susie the traits that he's portraying by asking questions of how valuable those traits are, both of them come into using those traits, not from the extreme, but from that place of what I was saying earlier, which is manageable, manageable, manageable um, assertiveness. So suddenly Susie's able to powerfully say, you've overstepped my boundaries. And mm -hmm. Johnny's able to powerfully say, I understand and empathize with you. And Susie sits going, I understand and empathize where you are. They're able to step back and look at that bigger picture you were talking about. So they become each other's inadvertent teachers when they've got the skills and tools to ask those powerful questions. That's what's missing. So what do you think um, it's important for parents to understand as they are watching their children go through this process of figuring out this balance between positive and negative? And then what are the indications that the situation is to the point where we need to get someone else involved? So if part of this struggle is, is normal and 
we know there's good and bad, positive and negative. You know, part of it is there's some things you will learn to work through, but how do you look for those warning signs that maybe we need some help here? I mean, there are many warning signs with teenagers. Um, the extreme ones were the ones I mentioned earlier. Uh, but obviously there's where the, the child, it, 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 as a parent, and I know this, um, for a parent, when you know that you're responding to your child from a place of judgment and fear and knee-jerk reactions, I mean, how often as a parent have we stopped and gone, oh gosh, that was my mother that just, her words that came out my mouth. <laughs> And I promised I'd never, ever say that All right. child. <laughs> and, and it flowed, right? It just flowed right out naturally, like, right? Wow. And, and that's the fear and judgment as parents that we have in ourselves. We're, we're, we're wanting to be that perfect parent, but no mm -hmm. parent in their right mind puts their newborn child into their arms and goes, how can I do the worst for you? We're doing right. our best, but that that deeply rooted fear and judgment of ourselves as parents and our programming from what our parents said and did and their parents and their parents, mm -hmm. it's come through the generations, uh, is, is really difficult to manage from a place of open-hearted understanding. Right. So I always say to parents, it's about, again, working on yourself first, because if you're if you're able to peel away all those judgments and fears and speak from open hearted <clears throat> acceptance and grace and spontaneous love, which is what a photon moment creates then you access that inner wisdom inside you. And I, I've watched myself since losing Jen, having the most incredibly powerful conversations with the rest of my family, as well as my children. And when I ha I don't, you know, every now and then I go, there's me again, back to where I was. I've got right. the tools to go away and go, ha, it's time to process yourself, Janetta. Mm -hmm. So for parents that are looking for new ways to, to communicate with their children, it's about changing your inner dialogue, not to judge it that it needs to be changed, but to appreciate that you're missing the skills to completely in, uh, embrace the, the parts of you that has a silent conversation of you're a loser parent, you're, you're, yeah. you're not good enough. Uh, all those things make it really difficult to, pa to parent from a really balanced, open heart. So um, long before dealing with the child, although ideally, if I've got both parent and child or children or parents working simultaneously, I've got, I've got one that I worked with yesterday, just heart opening to hear the conversations in this last week that awesome. that family have had with each other. And he was he had suicide idea, ideation oh. and, and it's gone. And they're talking, they're talking truthfully. I think that's what it is. They're talking truthfully. They're talking their truth, not from a place of wanting to destroy or hurt or judge. They're talking their truth from their heart and because everybody's got the tools to accept that truth, it's not taken from a place of, of hurt. It's taken from a place of appreciation. Oh, is that how you're feeling? Oh. Wow. I didn't realize that's what you were thinking or feeling. That's the sort of new conversations that start happening. You so know, it starts that's, with that's, yeah, that's a beautiful thing because sometimes you see certain behaviors or certain actions. And a lot of times I think in parent children relationships, that's frustrating. And that begins to be the focus when you have that conversation and you figure out, oh, that's why you were doing that. 
Oh, you were walking outside with no shoes on because your shoes are too small and you need new shoes. Oh, okay. Now I just, I won't just yell at you for being outside with no shoes. It's a strange example, but I get it. And uh, you've brought a lot of, I think, unique perspectives on the matter. And I think that's good for us because there's no one size fits all in the world. And that's the purpose of the show is just to open up some different pathways. There's not one perfect parent out there. There's not one perfect child out there. And there's not one perfect methodology or approach that is this genius cure for everyone. So this is about bringing about different groups of ideas and giving parents, you know, if this doesn't work, maybe I try this or maybe I, I look into that. So I love the, uh, the unique perspective that you've brought today. And I definitely want to make sure that we talk about um, anything that you have coming up and exactly how people can get in touch with you if they want your services. Um, just, just tell us whatever you have coming up that you want us to know about and make sure that we know exactly how to get in touch with you. Oh gosh, Elaine, thank you. What I'm stepping into now is it, it's where my heart sits uh, uh, and it's an amazing, amazing happening. Uh, several years after Jen died, we realized she died on World Mental Health Day. Wow. Yeah, and that's 10th of October, 1010. And uh, so last year we launched the very first uh, World Jenny's Day on World Mental Health Day. So this is the second time we're running it. And um, the day we've been so busy with this and I've got a, a team of people volunteering. We could do it with a lot more volunteers. So anybody Fantastic. where this speaks to their heart, I'd love to chat to them about it. But um, we're running the day on a, a, a virtual platform and uh, it's going to embrace dealing with what it's like, because I, I, I try and steer away just using depression these days, what mm -hmm. it's like to feel compromised, overwhelmed, different, out of sorts, depressed, whatever it is. And we're using animation and um and what it uh, and then just the solutions we're using is a theatrical production we put on three years ago with contemporary dance and voice and song and and, mm -hmm. and music and visuals um, that address depression, suicide, and solutions. So we're using numbers from the show as excerpts, and then discussion forums on the solutions to feeling like that. Um, especially with people who have really got through their depression and they're sitting there going, uh, it, it, this is my new life um, <clears throat> and how they did it. And then we're also addressing the carers of that, uh, of that scenario because I felt totally lost. When Jen died, wow. it was her fourth attempt. It was the wow. fourth time. So you feel so lost. So we're going to address that also through theater and, and the arts and also solutions and discussion forums. So that's the day that World Jenny's Day is going to be. <clears throat> but of course, yeah. that involves a lot. It involves a huge amount and a lot of uh, fundraising and uh, a lot of organizations. So if anybody would like to chat to me about that, that would be amazing. But do you want to mention some of the types of things that you need volunteers to do? Yes, please. Well, fundraisers, we, we, if we could get a professional fundraiser or two, that would be amazing. Um, but uh, all the people behind the scenes, uh, I've got a, a group project manager, Katanu Mwosa from Kenya, because I'm from Kenya even though I live in the okay. UK. Yeah. Um, and, and until last year, I still had my home in Kenya. And after all this lockdown, I'll, I'll reset my home again there, have mm -hmm. here in the UK and in Kenya. And Katanu is, is the world project manager for World 
Jenny's day and she's amazing, but I know she could do with a lot of help on overseeing that project. And I could do actually with another VA, somebody volunteering for that. People in the arts, if they would like to step forward, uh, we're doing a whole marathon with, with the arts on Clubhouse for 24 hours, if anybody's interested in that, on the day. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, anybody that, if this resonates with you, talk with me and uh, let's hear your skill sets that we can bring in. Because I'd rather bring in people who go, that's what I would love to do than say, this is who we want. Yeah, excellent. So, Somebody yeah. that, that identifies with it and yes. is passionate about participating. And the, the bigger picture is that World Jenny's Day will be known internationally. Every time it comes up, people go, oh, that's World Jenny's Day, because that's the legacy I want to leave behind. There's three legacies. World Jenny's Day and that theatrical production, which is called Insight, those two are, are, are the charity arms of the epiphany process, which is the name of my okay. process. Okay, so, so everything I, is connected. Yeah, which makes so much sense. So I want to, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I'm now a grandmother and, you know, before we know it, it's like, wow, I'm, I'm at that end of life. So I want to hand the baton over to the next generation. Those mm -hmm. that are really wanting to take the epiphany process and get it out there, hand that baton over to them and then hand the World Jenny's Baton Day over to a, a World Jenny's Day Baton over to those people who are inspired to be part of that. And then the theatrical baton over and we franchise that theatrical production worldwide. It's now, it was, it was so well received that production that it was invited to be performed in in Europe a couple of months Beautiful. after. Beautiful. So those are the three areas, not just World Jenny's Day. Okay. Anybody inspired by any of that? Chat to me. So how? So let's tell them exactly how they can get in touch with you. Um. Well, I'm I'm on www.theepiphanyprocess.com. Uh, okay. You can email me at Janetta at the epiphany process.com. So you very specially get straight to me there. Um, I'm on Facebook as Janetta Barry, uh, Twitter, uh, Insta is Janetta underscore Tep, um, uh, even LinkedIn. There's even a Janetta Barry in the epiphany process page on Facebook. And there's also a, a Jenny's Day page on Facebook as well okay. so you can get hold of me in in any of those places fantastic fantastic oh. lots of wonderful things going on I was looking at some of the work that you've done in in Kenya and other areas around the world and it's very inspiring what you're doing with the events that are coming up and, and things you're doing in other parts of the world so I, I don't have the whole world here to thank you. So I will just thank you on behalf of the world. How about well, that? <laughs> thank you. It is just so lovingly received and appreciated. And I just want to say how appreciative I am of holding the space with you and how much I appreciate well, you, Elaine. You're amazing. Thank you. Oh, don't tell me that. What will I do with myself? <laughs> no. No, well, thank you. Thank you truth. very much. <laughs> well, the feeling is mutual. I will definitely be getting in touch with you so that I can be involved in some of the activities. And I hope others who are listening, who have understood that we have someone here who has really been unselfish and very given and is continuing to do things for others and you identify with that, then please definitely get into contact with Janetta. Look up the epiphany process. And I want to thank everyone who has listened and tuned into the podcast today to my teens out there. If you need help, then make sure you say something, let someone know 
uh, because it's not easy. Uh, sometimes you get in situations in life and it can be very frustrating. It can be disappointing and that's reality. And sometimes as you're growing, we need help figuring out how to get through certain situations. So if you're looking at a situation and you can't get through it all by yourself and it's overwhelming, then just start asking around for some help and some support. But please don't get to the place where you're so overwhelmed and it's just you and you, you feel like there's no one out there. Um, I know my teens can be very resilient and strong. So at least be strong enough and resilient enough to push through until you get to that person that can help. And then if you want to collapse in their arms and, and, and have the, those times where you're not strong, that's fine. But I, I want you to keep fighting until you, until you find your, your place of support. I love that. Yes. Yes. So thank you all very much for staying here and sharing in the wisdom of Janetta. Thank you to my teens. I know this isn't necessarily an easy topic to listen to. And if you're personally not having issues where you need this type of support, then you could definitely have a friend or a family member who is. So this has been a great learning lesson for all of us. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Empower Teen Self-Esteem. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Empower Teen Self-Esteem. Please follow Kids More Sugar on social media. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel to show that you support this content. And you can visit our website at kidsmoresugar.com to learn more about our free online kids program. Thank you.